What's up, guys? Welcome to Culture Binge, Wisecrack's culture podcast, where we get into everything going on in our zeitgeist. I am Michael, and I am here with Wisecrack writer, editor, and everything else, Alec. How you doing, Alec? Hey. And Wisecrack researcher, Serby. Serby, what's good? Hi. Hey. So this is a, a fun one, because I think this is the first time we've ever recorded where everyone is remote, so uh, hopefully no one notices a lack of intimacy in the conversation. I mean, we're all remote anyway. You're just in your quarantine bunker. I am in my quarantine bunker. Uh, it's an undisclosed location. Please, no one uh, sort of look up images to see where I am and make sense of it based on where the light's coming through. I don't want to be found. So we have a lot to talk about today. Um, we're going to get into uh, self-care. We're going to talk about how diseases shape the world. We'll look a little bit at how you can have a social life, even if it's just digitally based through distance. But to get started, let's talk about what's currently slapping and chapping in our lives. Uh, so, Alec, you want to get us started with, with what slaps and chaps in your life these days? Uh, not much. No, uh, I, a few days before New York City shut down, bought Civilization VI for Nintendo Switch, and thank God. Because oh, if wow. you want to just destroy hours of your life, what a great, what a great way to do it. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, that's a video game where you build a civilization, uh, and I just usually nuke a lot of people. It's very, like, against type for, for who I am. Wow. <laughs> what does that say about you? I don't know. Uh, and then what chaps is uh, obviously a lot right now, but uh, this is something I've talked to with several people, including Michael Burns. Uh, people who work from home now have, like, partners who are home. Uh, and feeling surveilled 24 seven, even if the other person is not doing anything wrong or judgmental. Uh, so this has happened to at least three or four people. I know you're eating your third bowl of cereal. Maybe you've gone through a pound of dried mango in a day or two. That wasn't me, by the way, that was somebody else. Uh, just somebody knows. And that in itself is like a hell in and of itself. Um, and I feel like Garcon and no exit, but, but have you, you've encountered this a little bit from the other end, Michael. Um, I've encountered this. I am the one who does not normally work from home. So I'm the intruder in my partner's safe space. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very different. It's very different to be uh, forced together with someone 24 seven and have your like private habits show up and have your little like break rituals be judged by another person. It's, it's a lot. And I'm sure a lot of us are going through this. Yeah. All right. Um, Serby, what's slapping? What's champing? So what slaps is that I just found out that CVS All Access is giving free access to CVS All Access until April 23rd. And I'm looking forward to watching the new Star Trek show. Well, I guess it's not new anymore, but it's new to me, Star Trek Discovery, and the new uh, Captain Picard show. So I'm very excited about that. I'm and so then, excited for you. Is it good? Have you seen it? Uh, Discovery gets good. There's like problems. The second season's pretty good. Uh, Picard, I have very mixed feelings about it, which could mm. be a whole nother chaps, but we'll, we'll I'll abstain. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm still excited, though, about Star Trek Discovery, though. That sounds should really be. Good. Um, okay. And then the, what chaps is, so in Southern California, we have K-Rock, a radio station, and I grew up listening to this morning show called Kevin and Bean, and I just found out that Kevin of Kevin and Bean was fired and I was so super sad to hear about that. There were so many people that um, started on Kevin and Bean, and now they're like huge celebrities, like um, Jimmy Kimmel, who has his own like heard of him, night yeah, talk show, yeah. And so I was really sad to hear that the show ended. Um, I haven't listened to it in a couple of years, so that was really. Wait, sad was he headline. was he fired for like being bad? Because I just always assume when anyone's fired from anything, they did something bad. Dude, I saw. I thought the same thing when I saw like Kevin, <laughs> Kevin and being fired. I was like, no, is he a toucher? I'm like, no. Yeah. Well, and, radio hosts always sound kind of creepy, so I don't know. Not podcast hosts. They sound cool. Yeah. So, podcast hosts he, don't ever do things like that. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, because we're all working remotely, so we can't touch each other. Um, so Whoa. He. <laughs> He, uh, he, so Bean of Kevin and Bean left last year, so the ratings were quite low. So I think the show just got rid of him. Um, but anyway, I think they should get into podcasting. I think that would be great if they did that. So it was very I, I bet it'll happen. Why not pivot to podcast? That's when you do when all else fails. You got nothing better to do. 
Right now. Why not? Yeah, get in your bunker and start a podcast. Uh, well, that's good. I'll say my slaps. I'm going to do quickly do two. Uh, I've started rewatching Anthony Anthony Bourdain's No Reservations, his like first big TV show from the beginning, and it's been fun. Uh, it, it's been different to wa- go back and watch someone in the early stages of their television career be kind of sloppy and, and messy around the edges. But I found some comfort in seeing him on my TV. The other quick thing that slaps is a friend recommended a recipe to me to, me to make a, a plant-based bolognese ragu style sauce using Beyond Meat. I was very skeptical, spent all Saturday working on it, and it was delicious. So that was awesome, and it's held up pretty well too, so I've been eating it a lot. Uh, what chaps for me is related to the last one, I, I just miss eating out. I like going to restaurants. I like going to bars. I like walking to pick up tacos at a local stand or something like that. And there's lots of things that one can complain about in this world of self-isolation and quarantine. I miss going to restaurants. So it's my only hobby. That's the only thing I'm like, you know, I drink, but not really like as a hobby, but I do eat as a hobby. Yeah. I think that's really what I'm getting at. And I just didn't have the, the sort of courage to admit it, that basically eating is my hobby. <laughs> and when I can't go out to eat, I feel like I'm hobbyless. Do you still get delivery or pick up the food? I have got, we got delivery once in the past week. I will say, I'm not going to say who, but someone who's not me that lives in my house of two <laughs> is a little more scared slash nervous about getting delivery in this time. So, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's hard to do because a lot of restaurants, at least around where I live, have, have just shut down entirely. So it's a pretty limited roster these days that's still doing delivery. Mm. So exciting stuff, I know. But we have a lot to talk about, so we should get into it. So um, we're going to talk about how diseases shape the world. We're going to have a master class in self-care. But first, I, I wanted to start by talking about the issue of social connectivity, Not because for any reason people have a lack of that these days, but precisely because depending on where you're listening to this from in the world, uh, if you are in North America, if you're in Europe, if you're in Asia, there's a good chance that you have recently been socially isolated or quarantined. You're in your house for an indeterminate period of time. Maybe if you're in like uh, uh, the Southern Hemisphere, this hasn't gotten to you yet, so you can consider this your preparatory masterclass. But one of the things we've all dealt with recently is being alone more than we have before or being stuck in our house with our partner while they judge us for eating cereal more than we have previously. Um, and, and it's I'll start with the maybe bummer side of this and we can get into the happy side. Uh, but I went and did some reading on how social isolation can affect us. And the spoiler alert is, is not good. Um, so, you know, uh, so being alone and being socially isolated can lead to boredom. Boredom then can get into lethargy, depression and anxiety. And especially I read one researcher and this is in a uh, Wired article talked about how the lack of a clear endpoint creates even more anxiety. So like prisoners in jail, when they find out, oh, you're getting out on, you know, April 15th, their moods immediately lift and they get happy because there's an end in sight or maybe a more relatable example to most of our listeners. Uh, You know, the last day of school or something like that. When we know there's an ending, we can get over that. For many of us right now, there is no clear ending point. Um, You know, the mortality effect of social isolation is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. What? So if you, yeah. So if you already- what, What group? Like- Um, Especially the old, but if you're like socially isolated, even just as a normal person and you fall into uh, deep lethargy and all these things, that's the type of health effect it has on you, which is why a lot of people I know have have actually quit smoking uh, in this during this time, which is very smart, because I guess if you already smoked 15 cigarettes, then you'd basically smoke 30 a day with this. Um, It is possible to to get straight up uh, PTSD symptoms via long-term social isolation. And and loneliness is actually a biological warning sign to seek out other humans. And I never heard of it described this way before, which Mm -hmm. I found really interesting that it's it's our, our body basically saying, seek out other humans the same way that thirst is like, drink water, you dummy. And of course, uh, last, but definitely not least, isolation and the, the, the prolonged effects of isolation can actually weaken our immune systems. And I know, I don't know if you guys are experiencing this, but everyone I know every day is like, oh, I thought I was sick today. Today I might be sick. Oh, I had a sniffle. Oh, I had a sore throat. We are constantly thinking that we might be sick. And so social isolation is not going to make that easier. Go ahead, Alec. I, I do think there's a caveat to that in that I was uh, previously in a 
similar situation where like I couldn't be sick with someone I knew whenever I was visiting them, they have a compromised immune system. If I had a cold and gave it to them, it would be very bad. And every time I had to hang out with that person, it was like, ooh, I don't know, my throat's itchy. Like, yeah. I sneezed five hours ago. What if, what if this is a cold? And so now I'm dealing with the exact same thing every time. I'm trying not to go out, but, you know, like uh, exercise is still allowed. So I'm going on, you know, occasional walks like every other day. Uh, but I'm just like, am I, am I sick? And I'm like taking my temperature. Thank God I have a thermometer. Yeah. Otherwise I probably wouldn't have left the house in two weeks. But uh, yeah. And so when you say social isolation though, these are not studies about kind of like what's happening right now. This is like true disconnect from all human interaction. Um, yeah. So, so things like either elderly people that are living alone for extended periods of time. Uh, we got people in prisons, um, astronauts, which is a mm. relatable scenario. Um, but, but the studies range from, you know, people that simply just live alone and aren't connected to other humans to people that live in space. Um, and, and, and the resources, and I can post these links later, um, but recently there was articles on Wired, uh, the New Yorker, and the New York Times that all came out in the past 48 hours on this topic. Pretty easy to find. So if anyone wants to look that up and fact check me, I dare you. Um, now, of course, that's the bad stuff. The, the good stuff, the positive stuff is, is what can we all do right now? Um, how can we recreate some of that? Now, the, the thing is we can't exactly recreate what it's like to physically be around someone, hanging out, high five and hug and all that sort of stuff. But there's a lot we can do. So I'm just going to run through a list and then I want to hear what you all have been doing, what you suggest doing, those sorts of things. And of course, what we'd love to hear after the fact from our listeners and viewers what you're doing. But I'll run through a list. Basic stuff. Online gaming, many people already do that. Do it more and game in scenarios where you can talk to people. Um, lots of people have been talking recently about catching up on Zoom, Skype, and Hangouts and FaceTime. Zoom is really, their stock must have gone up incredibly. Like the one stock that must be doing well right now is Costco. Zoom. Zoom and Costco, yes. Um, but something people have been doing, which is kind of fun on all of these video conferencing platforms, um, I have a lot of friends that have been doing online happy hours. So setting up things, regular sessions, like you know, twice a week it, from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Here's our chat room, everyone make a drink and let's hang out. I think the regularity especially is great because you have something to look forward to. People have been doing dance parties. Now that is not for me, but if you're the type of person who wants to get on a video app and listen to music and watch strangers dance, I respect that, I think it's cool. <laughs> Once again, not for me. Um, there's an app that's called a Netflix Party that's a Chrome extension that allows you to watch movies with friends and it'll start them at the exact same time. So if you use Netflix Party and we all, we're all going to watch uh, The Master together, I just said that because it's the last movie I watched, um, you know, we could link up and then you could also be on your Discord, WhatsApp, whatever, talking to your friends about watching it, which is pretty fun. Um, online multi multiplayer games are great. I don't know about you all, but I've been in a few uh, Quiplash and Fibbage sec uh, sessions in the past week, and those are all available via Jackbox. We're not sponsored by Jackbox. If they want to sponsor us, they should feel free. Um, <laughs> but, but it's a really cool service, and I know Jackbox, as of last week, put a bunch of their games on sale for like $4.00. Oh, cool. And yeah, and if you haven't played these games before, super easy. You download it on one person's computer. Only one person has to own it. Everyone else logs in with their phone using a code. And then the move is you, you get on Hangouts. Everyone can talk to each other, joke around. You play the game. It's very fun. I would say the most the most like engaging social life I've had in the past two weeks was having six friends on a call and playing Quiplash for a few hours. Very fun. A um, thing my partner's done that I haven't done is starting a book club with old friends. So she linked up with some high school buds. They got on a call and they're going to start reading a book together. Uh, almost done here. Uh, well, second to last thing, you could work on a creative project with friends. Maybe you and a bud have always wanted to write a comic together or you thought it'd be fun to write a silly movie or, or make some music together. Find a creative project that you can work on with other people or by yourself. It's something to do. The last thing and something I find fun, do you all know what couch tour is? No. no. So it is a trend that, that got started a few years ago in music uh, in which this company, the main company that does this is called Nugs, kind of a gross name for a company. Sounds um, like a weed service. It's Yeah, well, it sounds like weed stuff, but then it, it also makes me think of poop. I'm sorry. It just is the case that those okay. are the two things the word Nugs make me think of. Uh, but they started recording these really high quality um, concert videos, of live bands. They broadcast live. They record them. They have them on a service. And a lot of bands now are releasing concerts for free. 
very high quality. So for example, last Saturday, a band I'm embarrassed to love, but I love Dead and Company, the recent iteration of the Grateful Dead featuring John Mayer. Uh, they're putting out a new show every Saturday night. So me and two friends that like that a lot, watch the show together, um, talked throughout it just like you would at a real concert, not paying attention to the music. Uh, but a lot of people are doing that. Um, last week, Willie Nelson put together a streaming concert with tons of different artists that included Woody Harrelson and Paul Simon singing together outside in Hawaii. That was a real thing. I think um, Pitchfork, the music website, has been keeping track of this. So there are a lot of opportunities to watch live music, whether it's some musician like Neil Young playing songs from his fireplace, which he's been doing, sitting there and playing songs for people, or rebroadcast of, of concerts and stuff like that. So those are things that I've either heard about or been doing. Um, what have you all been doing to create the semblance of social connectivity and a real life in these weird times? So um, my life hasn't changed very much from like, <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty much my life. Uh, so um, I, I don't, I'm not struggling with it at all. I mean, I do like Great. to go out to like the store or like, walk around and stuff like that but i i don't really engage with other humans ever um so <laughs> <laughs> it sounds weird but i work remotely like i don't know i don't really do anything um so uh i did join the zoom dance party that happened last friday oh tell um, us more so it was fantastic like it somebody linked it on uh my company slack and was like there's this giant dance party and i'm like what so I clicked the link and there were 950 people when I joined and I had my screen off like I wasn't participating, but I was going through the pages and people had like strobe lights and like glitter stuff and some people were wearing costumes and wait, so you just a... creeped on everyone? Were you even dancing or were you just creeping on everyone dancing? I was creeping on everybody dancing. <laughs> um, and so uh, it was fantastic. I had such a great time. Like people were so into it and they had costumes and there was a DJ. Um, it was amazing. I loved it. I had like the biggest smile on my face the whole time. And people were, they were like, there was this one um, group. They were all dressed in those like inflatable dinosaurs. And they're all like, like with their little dinosaur heads. Um, there was a guy who was dancing with his plant. That was really fun. Um <laughs> So I loved it. I had a great time watching everybody have a good time. Um, uh, you should participate next time. I think that's next time. you kind of. I think I feel like you broke the social contract there. I did. Oh. Yeah. 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 It was a little too voyeury. Um, but next time I'll I'll join in if they do another one. Um, but one thing that I heard that was kind of interesting is um, I heard of a, like people like either couples or like singles or whatever they'll cook the same meal. And mm. then have dinner together over Zoom and, like, talk about the meal that they created and pretend like they're at a restaurant. So maybe that could fill the void for you. I just already threw, like, you know how people's lives flash before their eyes when they die? What flashed before my eyes when you said that is me and my partner trying to do that, me finishing dinner first and us having a fight when she's like, well, we need to wait till till, till Kathy and James are ready. And me being like, what? I'm going to eat cold food. I work all day. I'm stuck inside. And now I have to eat fucking cold <laughs> food. So I will never do that. But I'm glad that people are. Um, Alec, what have, what have you all been doing to, to, to keep life going? Or are you also just really leaning into this and enjoying the hermit life? Well, part of my <laughs> life hasn't changed because I also work from home. But... You know, part of the reason I maintain my sanity is by, like, going on regular walks and, like, scheduling things outside of the house and hanging out with people, um, although I do have a, a shut-in tendency, as I've talked about before. Uh, but it's really, like, actually, I'm spending more time with my friends than I ever did. Um, I think for, like, a variety of reasons. One is there's, like, a lot less conflicting plans. Uh, mm -hmm. So, for instance, you know, like, a lot of my friends, we talk about, like, oh, we should, like play uh, video games online together, but like someone's working, someone's with their girlfriend, whatever. Uh, well, one of those friends, and I feel awful about this, but like they're unemployed now. And the other one who's always visiting his girlfriend can't. And so we just like played video games for four hours last night uh, and, you know, talked on Discord. Awesome. It, was, it was great. Um, but on the other end, like uh, I did a, a virtual trivia night where like, uh, you know, I, I do bar trivia is one of the things that I do a lot. Um, and it was just a small group of friends and we were each a team. And uh, I think we all Venmoed the winner $2 or something like that. Nice. Uh, and so that was a lot of fun. And I'm going to be hosting more of those with like different groups of people. Uh, 
but like I've talked to other people, you know, people who don't talk to family members that often are like on the phone all the time talking to their family members. I've been talking more to my family, which I'm uh, historically awful about, like calling both of my parents. Uh, so I've been doing that. Uh, so it's weird, like in spite of all this, like my social connectivity has like actually gone up. I still feel awful because I'm like not leaving the house and all that other stuff. Yeah. And it's not the same as being in the same physical room uh, as a person. Um, but there, like a weird silver lining of this catastrophe is that that there is that kind of connectivity. And it kind of reminds me of, you know, when the Internet was new, everyone was like super excited about the promise of the Internet. Like people can mm -hmm. find communities that will bring people closer together. They'll have an unprecedented <clears throat> amount of access to like information and all that went wrong, right? Like the unprecedented amount of information you had access to turned into like fake news and ant flat earthers and shit like that immediately. You, you know, the community building just turned into like weird echo chambers forming. But now I feel like the stuff about hosting online trivias where like people don't have the same sort of mobility, that that was like, I feel like the dream of the internet initially. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're actually doing it. Or like internet dance parties. Yeah. I mean, that's something I'm wondering, and this is something maybe that I don't want to bleed into a potential other topic we have, but I've been wondering what will, what might stick around after all of this is said and done, how we might be like rehabituating ourselves to using the internet in the ways that we all thought we were going to use it, you know, 15 to 20 years ago. So we will see if any of that happens, but yeah. And I, I think the same, like you said before, I've been talking to friends so much more than I have and talking to family more than I want to, but you feel like you have to. Um, so it's been fun. And I would say too, not that this is really a, as much of a social thing, but um, yeah, we should all like take walks and exercise if you can. I know that stuff's boring and sucks. Um, if you are an exercise person, I know I've tried some of the online workout videos and there's so much stuff on like YouTube. So even if you have 15 minutes and no weights, um, some guy with a shaved head with a name like Blaine will yell at you and tell you <laughs> what exercises to do. There's good yoga stuff online. Of course, taking walks is nice. And one thing I found, I don't know if you all find this when you take your walks. I found like in the past 10 days, there's this cycle that's happened of I would go on walks, you know, 10 days ago and no one knew if you at like what it meant to social distance and some people would still walk right by you. And then I would like swerve away, but I would feel bad. Like someone thought I didn't want to see them in particular. Um, and then I felt like maybe five days ago, people started social distancing, but they didn't really look at each other. There was like a sense of shame. But <laughs> yesterday I went on a walk and it was the first time, like, you know, whether I swerved into the road or the other person did, we'd look at each other with this kind of like, what are you going to do? Um, <laughs> and that made me have like the little bit of, of the acknowledgement of like, this is weird, but we're in this together made me feel very nice. I, yeah. I really, I really liked that. And I, I hope that we can all get there and no one should feel guilty about walking around someone. It's, 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 it's a way to show someone you love them if anything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Um, any other final thoughts from anyone about social connectivity? Because that's all I got. I think maybe. So I've been looking at Twitter a lot because people have been posting like really funny videos or just like funny comments. So I find a lot of joy in in that, like understand, like relating to other people's experiences that we're yeah. separated by distance and things, but we're all going through the same thing. So I find a lot of joy in that. That's real. Finding joy in Twitter is special and, and rare and good. So I'm glad you found it. Memes are better than they've ever been. We're going to look at this as the golden age of memes on TikTok and Twitter, et cetera. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I will, I'll close with this because I think this is kind of related. Um, I, I do think it's important to remember during all this, if you're someone that is on social media a lot, there's kind of like two paths to go down. Uh, Serbian and Alec just pointed out all the good stuff, fun videos, memes, stuff like that. There's also more terrifying news and rumor than you could ever consume in a lifetime. Maybe choose to go one way on that. Maybe choose to have fun right now. And remember that if we're being responsible, we're social distancing, that's truly all we can do. Uh, unless you are an epidemiologist or a doctor or a grocery store worker or someone who's on the front lines. If you are, awesome. We appreciate your service. You're the fucking best. But if you're just a normal schmuck like the rest of us, you, it doesn't make you a better person to be uh, chugging news down your gullet 18 hours a day. Feel free to enjoy fun memes online and, and, and have fun gaming and all that sort of stuff. You're not Dan Rather. You don't need to know all the news. Just enjoy your life while you can. Um, sorry, I'll get off my soapbox, but 
feel like I it's important to say that. Advice though, because I I do think people are getting stressed out, and it's not going to do you any good. Yes, and I once again I say this as someone who my tendency is to consume every bit of news and and get obsessed with things and it maybe has led to me not feeling so great so don't be like I'm, me i'm actively not telling you things because i think it'll freak you out oh, i appreciate that so much i think a couple <laughs> people in my life i've had a few texts in the past days that are like how are you feeling can you handle hearing something and i'm just like unless it is, is a anecdote about jimmy are you buffett in the mind space to accept this information at this moment oh yeah that was so good um oh memes 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 are great uh okay so that's that's all i got to say about social connectivity uh we'd love to hear what you all think about this and we can we'll give you our contact information later but serby i feel like you are going to enlighten us to the joys and importance of self-care am i right yes hopefully let's get into it yeah so uh i mentioned in our last episode that i'm going through breakup and it's quite devastating And I reached out to Jared actually on a recent tear-filled Friday night and I asked him um, something like, when will I stop feeling sad? And he um, talked about the importance of self-care. And for those of you who don't know, self-care means paying attention to your psychological and physical wellness. And so when he said that, I was like, oh, like self-care, that's right. I mean, he didn't use those words, but it was like in a larger discussion of things that he was talking about. And then uh, my mom had also told me that I wasn't doing any self-care. And I realized that that had been having significant detrimental effects on my overall well-being. And it sometimes I think in times of stress and crisis, it's, it's hard to see how your state of mind and your experience or feelings are affected by how well your basic needs are met. And it's important to take care of yourself because if you don't, it's hard to bounce back and be resilient. So I've been trying to do mindfulness and meditation because it has been shown to slow brain aging and decrease stress hormones. I've been trying to sleep better Um, And I've been trying to eat better because I think the first two weeks um, that I broke up, I hadn't eaten very much in two weeks. And then for the next six weeks, I think I ate basically fries the whole time. Um, So Sure filmed it. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, that would have been great. I would have been making so much money right now, like mukbang quarantine. Um, And so (laughs) I, (laughs) I, I just think that that it took an objective perspective, like my mom and and Jared, to sort of force me to see what I was putting myself through. And I was fortunate to have people in my life to notice these things and to bring them to my attention, but not everybody does. So I have a couple of questions in this discussion. And one is, do you think that people might benefit from having a mentor or a therapist or somebody who's assigned either at birth or at different life stages that you can go to as a resource or a sounding board who can help bring these things to your attention? I feel, I mean, I think people who who seek that out, obviously that's great. Is that just the job of parents though? Obviously not every single parent would do so, but like, you know, I think parents either unwittingly or wittingly pass on like coping techniques to their kid and like how they deal with stress, you know, for the, for better or for worse. And I think that's there. Or, you know, like if your parent is, you know, meditating every day or exercise, like, you know, that, that kind of stuff passes on, but I don't know if it necessarily needs the institutionalization. Although, you know, obviously people do now go, you know, seek the help of a therapist who can teach them those skills because not everyone does get it, you know, from their parents or lots of things happen sort of in the interim. What what do you think, Michael? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, to expand on one of the things you said, I think one of the issues is a lot of parents are trash. And uh, I think in, in those ways, I can objectively say with all the kindness in my heart, my parents were just complete trash in that way in terms of, Uh, modeling any level of like what it means to take care of yourself emotionally or mentally. I know that a lot of us, at least in my age bracket, grew up in a category where like therapists were for like weak people that had weird problems and you got to like take care of shit yourself. So I think 
a lot of that can just happen in the home. I do think there's one thing, and I know I've talked about this before. Uh, I, I grew up in a kind of religious background and spent a lot of years in and out of like churches in and out, like I'm getting passed around. Um, but, but I think one good thing about that life is I remember times in my life where there was like a young priest or someone who I could like talk to about stuff that wasn't apparent. And I was lucky, you know, I'm sure when I say I talk to a young priest, people listening are thinking bad things, but like I was lucky enough to only ever interact with pretty cool people in that environment. So I think that it's good to have, whether it's teachers or coaches or religious figures or whoever, but ideally, right? Like let's just, people should be good parents and, and pass on those skills in a helpful way. So when I'm thinking of like a mentor or somebody, it's somebody who's like trained and has like um, like evidence-based, research-based techniques that they can pass on. Mm. Because um, I was talking to a friend of mine who just broke up with her fiance and oh, she was shit. telling me that her, yeah, and Sorry. she was telling me that her, um, her mom was telling her, she and her fiance, they'd been dating for, they'd been together their whole relationship. They've been together for over 10 years. And so her mom, I think, was telling her to start dating again, like very quickly after the breakup. And I didn't think that was great advice because, I mean, it seems like my friend is still struggling with coping with the with that breakup and that loss. And so I thought, like, it would be so nice to have somebody that you could turn to. And it, it would be like a like just a resource that's available to everyone because not everyone has health insurance or has great access to care like that and there's could be a stigma like a cultural stigma depending on where you live or your family or something it would just be nice if it was normalized for people to just go to talk to you to say like i'm going through this breakup or i have a really shitty job should i quit like something that people yeah, can this, turn to this makes me think of i don't know if you all have heard of uh the, the french psychoanalyst jacques lacan <laughs> so uh so he's this french psychoanalyst big deal if you've ever listened to uh, show me the meaning you've heard austin talk about him a lot um, but one of the things he did, so he's this French psychoanalyst, kind of like a weird lefty dude, but his brother was a Catholic priest in France. So oh. something that, like, yeah, so this psychoanalyst, what he was obsessed with was the idea that psychoanalysis was a sort of secular confession, um, was a space where anyone could go to kind of talk, to explore their unconscious and their desires and their emotions. So what he did is he said to his brother, hey, bro, can you hook me up with the Pope? Because I want to talk to them about making like this a part of like a secular liturgy. And they worked with the French government as well to try to make that just like a thing that everyone had access to. Now, it didn't work out. The Pope didn't say, yes, French psychoanalyst uh, Jacques Lacan, make your practice a part of the Roman Catholic Church. But it's an idea that I've always found really interesting, that there should be some sort of secular space of, of like confession and openness that we all have access to. It sounds like that could tick some of the boxes you're talking about, Serbi. I yeah. think the I think the only thing, like when it comes to not everyone can, you know, afford to see a therapist and stuff, like I think that access is important, but the, I guess like in an institutionalized setting, and I, I guess I'm just imagining like a, like a government program or a nonprofit. I mean, we've talked in this episode, uh, sorry, not in this episode, in the show before about how mindfulness and mindfulness in general is like great it helps a lot of people but it's kind of weaponized by corporations to say like, hey you're overworked mm -hmm. uh that's not our fault this like here are the coping skills you need and i feel like if you filter through people's problems with their job with their relationship with whatever uh even in terms of self-care it'll get sort of filtered through like the mandates of either like business or, or the government or anything like that. And so that's why, like on the one hand, I'm like, yes, people should have access to therapists. They should have, you know, uh, all that stuff, possibly some sort of like <laughs> confessional situation, but I just wouldn't trust like any singular organization to administer it, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the hard thing with all this. Cause like we've talked about, I feel like this is something we've come back to a few times in different topics is, you know, things that help us out, in terms of like psychology, emotions, and self-care are good when they're primarily focused on us, risky when it's about making us better workers and preparing us better to be like the cogs in the machine. Yeah, and this is a little bit different than the institutional thing, but like self-care is a concept that I think is really important for a lot of people and I'm not shitting on it, but I think all of us have noticed the ways in which like horrible narcissists have also weaponized it. 
Um, <laughs> and like a great example, I was, there's a, an amazing article. Uh, God, I can't remember what it was in, but about the wing, uh, which is this like co-working <gasps> space. For oh women. yeah. Was it the That's New York like, times thing? Yeah. It's all about yeah. like empowering women and like, you know, self care is often used, uh, in that context. But in this case, self care was like rich, white ladies yelling at like minimum wage paid staffers because they didn't have enough champagne or the beauty bar ran out of like the right makeup. And, and granted, like not everyone talking about self-care means this. Obviously this isn't Serby's idea. Of, I need to <laughs> yell at a restaurant worker to feel good about myself. But I think, I don't know, like I, the, the concept always makes me nervous because I'm like, yes, but also this is where this easily leads unless like we sort of have this like holistic understanding of it. And I've even had a kind of uh, debate in my head because, you know, at home all day, I'm getting my groceries delivered and just buying dumb shit that I don't need, like chocolate bars or God knows what. And I'm like, you know, self-care, treat myself, whatever. And my debate is, oh, am I supporting the struggling restaurant industry and like, you know, keeping them in business and all that good stuff? Or am I just being a consumerist monster? The answer is probably both. I'm being a consumerist monster and also hopefully when I ordered $30 worth of stuff from the bagel place, keeping them in business. Wow. <laughs> no, but I, so I think that's you... a really Go ahead, Sorry. Oh, no, no. I was going to pivot to ask the next question. I'd love to hear your comment. Oh, well, no, I was just going to say uh, that I think that is an interesting point that gets brought up about how we use self-care. Because I think I'm going to say this, this author's name wrong, and I'm so sorry. Is it Audrey Lord? Is that how you say it? I think it's Audrey. Audrey Lord, yeah. So I know that I feel like Audrey Lord is the person who is is at least given credit for developing the idea of self care. But something that you know, one of the reasons she developed the idea was about women who are like activists, putting their lives on the line, spending all mm-hmm. this time fighting for equality in all these ways. And self care was like, after you've been putting your life on the line to fight for others for two weeks, maybe take some time to yourself. And there was some criticism initially that it was like well off people that were like, took the day off work to bat, take bats and watch TV or whatever. And it was kind of like, that's not what that means. So I think there is that line as well. Like, you know, Serby, obviously you're talking about going through a situation and I think a, a breakup is a heavy thing to go through and people should spend time doing that. But yeah, there's that line. It's like stolen valor. I think that like, <laughs> you know, if, if you... If you were going to talk about self-care, you need to have gone through a little bit of shit, at least, and not just, like, that you need it in normal life. But maybe that's me being harsh. Sir, get to your next thing. I'm sorry that I stopped you. So I'd love to know what you two do for self-care. I buy food. Oh, boy. Well, one thing that I think, you know... Somebody asked me the other day, Alec, what's your work from home routine? You've been doing this forever. Unfortunately, all those things that maintain my sanity, as I've mentioned, I can't do. Leaving the house several times a day, going on walks, you know, going to the gym, exercising, all that stuff. Um, But at least now I'm trying to exercise from home. I'm lucky enough that I have um, like I have a a bike, but I have like a little trainer so I can pedal in place, uh, which makes a lot of noise and probably drives my downstairs neighbor insane. Um, and you know, like different sort of like sit-ups, push-ups, yoga, e stuff, uh, on like a yoga mat. Uh, and so absent like actual exercise is just great for your mental health. Uh, and so like whatever amount that you can do, like, I think it's just about like getting your heart rate up and working your muscles, whatever, uh, degree that means, uh, it's just really good for you. So I think now, especially like I'm trying to, to keep that routine going, um, other than that, it's truly, I'm shopping for groceries. Oh, I haven't tried this weird dessert that is on sale. Self-care, baby. Treat yourself. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too far away from that. I think, um, I mean, one routine I have, if I'm having a rough day emotionally or I've gone through a rough stretch, there's a, a coffee place that has these awesome vegan strawberry muffins near where I live, and they have a nice little outdoor area. So I'll go there and just be like, hey, for the next hour, I'm going to eat a nice muffin, drink a coffee and like read whatever novel I'm reading from. That's something I like. Uh, when I was in grad school and I think that was grad school sucks. It's so hard. But when I would have rough periods, I would just take myself out to dinner. It's where I really got into like going out to eat alone, like sitting at the bar or whatever. Shut up. (laughs) It's not. Well, now I need, I need Alec. I need self care after dealing with Alec for a little bit. Um, and the other thing, sometimes I like to, uh, when I, get, I was going to say don't do drugs, but it's not a big deal because it's legal in most states. But sometimes I like to take like an edible and go hiking or walk in the woods or something. Oh, yeah. And I find that to be really 
kind of relaxing and often can get me to focus on how like trees in the sky look cool which I don't know might sound silly but is a nice way to disconnect from all of the things that stress us out so those would be my things but it'd be great to hear other stuff do you have any specifics that you've been doing Serbia I know you talked about it a bit before but any any greatest hits of self-care you'd recommend so I've been uh, exercising I've been trying to eat well and sleep better um, I also have been trying journaling, which Jared recommended. Um, that's been helping a lot. And I've been trying to do things like creatively, like with my hands. So I think like when I'm focused on things, it helps me not focus on how sad I am. So I'll like try to fix something. Like if there's like something broken around the house, I'll like try to figure out and like look at YouTube videos. And that gives me like a sense of accomplishment. Um, I also take really, and this is horrible, I know, because we're kind of still in a drought in California, but sometimes I take really long hot showers, um, mostly just so wow. I can, like put my face under the hot water, and like this way I can't feel the tears running down my cheek. I can just be like... <laughs> Serby, that was too real. I just got to say it. I'm just going to say that was too real, and I'm going to say, well, you know, it's we're all going through a lot, but that was one of the realest things I've heard in a while, and anyone who's listening to this, I don't know, that was a lot. I appreciate your, your candor. That was so much. Oh. Um, so okay. I think for anyone listening, um, some like basic self-care techniques would be like engaging in pleasant activities, like things that you like and bring you joy. Um, I know that it's hard to get outside right now, but if you could like stand in the sun, maybe you might be nice or just making sure that you do like basic hygiene stuff is really great. I think some people who are in distress sometimes neglect things like that, especially if they're depressed or anxious. Um, so that could be helpful. Um, doing art is might be nice. Mindfulness and meditation is good or like guided imagery. Um, there are a lot of different things and I encourage everybody to take some time to do self-care. You said one thing that I just wanted to like add a quick note to, but I think the sense of accomplishment is really important. And I think the bullshit jobs, another thing we've talked about, talks a lot about this, about the joy of being the cause and bullshit jobs deprive us of that. But I've also been trying to, I think it varies for, for people. Like for me, a sense of accomplishment, if I watch a movie that's like in the canon of like movies I'm supposed to have watched, like, oh, like I've accomplished that, finishing a book or uh, I started doing like a geography quiz game. Uh, but oh, what sorry. doesn't give me that is playing Civilization for six hours. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Um, well, thank you so much for bringing that topic up. Thank you for being so so vulnerable and real. And I'm glad that we know now that, that Jared's the person to go to for advice. So everyone yes. um, will give you Jared's address at the end of this, and you can just show up, and he'll help you. Um, away, so now that we – yeah. <laughs> yeah, from six feet away. But now that we all feel really good and positive, Alec is going to destroy that by telling us how diseases <laughs> shape our world. So, Alec, let's get into it. Yeah, so uh, I've been reading a lot about diseases even before all this, uh, and now I feel like, uh, oh boy, I have like a way to, to funnel all this information. Uh, but I'm really interested in the way diseases just historically have really, like we often think about history being shaped by people and movements and things like that, but sometimes it's just shitty microbes that are killing us all and, you know, how people react to them. And I mean, there's some obvious examples, whether it's culturally, geopolitically, but you know, the, the HIV epidemic in the 80s had long lasting repercussions. Uh, I don't have a source for this, but I imagine it put the final nail in the coffin for sort of ideas of free love. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, just if it weren't for that, we'd, our, our sexual culture would probably be much different. Um, an example people probably don't know, and I don't think I've brought this up before, or maybe in some context, uh, the reason that makeup products are marketed as milky. Serbia, have you encountered that word a lot? Maybe not. No, I haven't. Well, I, then again, I don't wear a lot of makeup. So milky white skin, all of these concepts, they come from actual like the reason we use the word milk is from actual milk maidens, people who are women who milk cows. And it was because smallpox was going around scarring everyone's faces for life. Like lots of most people were exposed to smallpox before there was a vaccine for it. I believe George Washington had some scarring going on. Uh, and the only people who didn't have scarred, fucked up faces were milkmaids. And the reason was because they got cowpox from cows, which is a really, it's a like cousin of smallpox. And this much more milder disease would give them immunity from smallpox. So Whoa. if you were looking for a fair skinned 
woman back in the day, you had to go to the, the nearest barn and find a milkmaid. She's immune. And this is how we figured out how to inoculate people against uh, uh, smallpox. Knowing that, uh, they started expanding the pro process to like other people uh, and exposing people to cowpox. And then they got the idea of you know exposing people to smallpox and all that. But uh, that is one sort of weird example. Uh, smallpox itself is like crazy in history. Uh, some of you might know this, but it wiped out uh, people estimate between 90 and 95% of Native Americans, uh, even before sort of like the large scale sort of conquest started happening, which made it much easier for that like conquest of North America, South America, et cetera. Um, and also I've seen that even before the main series of like sort of you know the the uh puritans and sorry not the puritans let me take that again uh even before sort of large-scale colonization in new england and stuff like that there were smaller exposures that already had like ravaged uh, um, certain native american communities but anyway that's just in one part of the world in ancient rome there was the antonine plague uh which is named after emperor and stoic philosopher marcus aurelius his family name is antonius antoninus um it ravaged rome twice it's believed to have been smallpox or measles they're not quite sure uh the reason it spread was because rome did all this cool shit about building roads and facilitating trade so people could travel large distances which kind of came back to bite them in the ass but According to some historians, it is a key event in the fall of the Roman Empire because, you know, a third of the Roman population was wiped out. It devastated the military, so they were less able to fight off encroaching Germanic tribes and Gaelic tribes, uh, which, you know, the Visigoths and all of them would end up sacking Rome. Uh, that was much later on, but a, a sort of key feature in there. Um, this is so interesting, Alec. Yeah. A lot of this... Uh, I. I'm using a few sources here, but I'm reading this book right now, Michael Kinch's Between Hope and Fear. Um, he talks about the the makeup thing. He talks about the Antoninum Plague. Uh, smallpox, also a key factor, they believe, in stopping Alexander the Great's invasion of India. They, in the Middle East, had seemingly contracted it. And when they were invading India, lots of people were dying. Alexander the Great probably died uh, because he was exposed to smallpox. And even if he didn't die from smallpox, they think it sort of messed him up. So he died more easily from something else. And George Washington during the Revolutionary War had a strategic advantage because he's one of the first people to um, advocate inoculating people against smallpox. Again, that inoculation technology born from the milkmaidens. Uh, but what happened back in the day, whether it was Washington or others, you'd be besieging a city when people are clustered in large urban areas. Things like cholera, smallpox, measles start ravaging you know, the, the population. And then the invading army catches it, and then they're screwed. And this is just a thing that's been happening for years and years and years. And so a lot of the vaccines that you see in the 20th century uh, are kind of pushed heavily by the military because they know what like a key critical role uh, in fighting wars that that you know infectious disease uh, uh, can take. So, the New Yorker cites this one author, Timothy Weingard, who argues that that uh, for much of military history, deaths caused by mosquitoes, he's talking about malaria, far outnumbered and were more, more and were more decisive than deaths in battle. And so that's just military shit. There's also uh, Michel Foucault, philosopher, argues that the bubonic plague, uh, there was this process called quadrilage, where a s town infected would be divided into quarters. There was like a lot of surveillance going around, people going from house to house outside, seeing if anyone was sick, if they were sick, removing them from their home. Uh, he argues that this is kind of the birth of the modern state and like bureaucracy and surveillance technologies. You know, he goes on to talk about surveillance in prisons and how it shapes our lives and all that stuff. Um, Speaking of the Black Death, there were massive labor shortages because everyone was dead, leading some of the first labor laws. But in this case, they create a maximum wage because workers were able to demand too much money from their bosses. <laughs> nice. And then more recently, even do you know, you might we eradicated smallpox. It only exists in labs now. And we're trying to eradicate polio. But during the Cold War, this was like key propaganda for both the U.S. and Russia because they could go around being like, we saved you from smallpox. Aren't you less pissed about this other shit we're doing? Uh, and so COVID corona is not bubonic plague, obviously, not even nearly as deadly. It's not smallpox, again, not nearly as deadly. But I am kind of interested in, at least based on projections, this sort of quarantine, 
will likely continue, at least in major metropolitan areas. Who knows what the president's going to do? Um, but I'm kind of interested in the large, I think, cultural shifts. Obviously, we're not talking about a war here. Um, but already I'm seeing like people seem OK with like universal basic income, like everyone should get thousand dollars a month, people you wouldn't necessarily expect from. Um, will it change people's perceptions of paid sick leave? That's kind of on the political spectrum, but on the sort of cultural spectrum, you know, to your earlier point, will months of quarantine, if that happens, cause spikes in mental health problems and drug abuse? Will this, you know, uh, in the early 20th century, there was rampant alcoholism in workers that led to the prohibition movement. Uh, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen here, but like, you know, when problems like that reach a certain inflection point, they can spawn movements. Um, will work from home gain more acceptance among bosses or will there workers who are losing it at home and not being productive? Will it sort of sour that perception for the rest of their lives? Uh, yeah. What, what do you think of those things? Other things? How, do you think if that do you think it'll change anything at all? Or do you think this is just going to be a weird historical footnote? I mean, I think it's going to change a lot. Um, I mean, one thing, and, and I've talked about this with Alec offline, uh, it really makes me think of the work of, of Naomi Klein, uh, in particular, her book, The Shock Doctrine, and this notion of disaster capitalism, and the idea that often disasters, cultural shifts, political revolutions, all this sort of stuff can lead to drastic changes. So like one example I'm thinking of, and this kind of relates to some of the work stuff you were talking about, Alec, is as someone who used to work in academia, a lot of my friends who are professors and academics have had to shift to online teaching. And my my sneaky prediction would be that for a lot of universities, they're now going to have an infrastructure in place to shift even more teaching online, to have you know less faculty and staff that they need for full time stuff. So I think we can already see how this might change work culture in a lot of ways. And like you said before, Alec, a lot of places are kind of testing out what remote work can be right now. And so that's maybe a little bit more on the negative side. On the flip side, I do think it's really interesting that like universal basic income, an idea that what a few years ago was kind of seen, seen as a little bit laughable is now becoming uh, a much more serious option. And I know in countries like, uh, I think Denmark is now floating giving 70 to 90 percent of lost wages to workers. England's doing up to 80 percent, up to like 2,500 pounds a month or something. So I do think like so quickly in the past couple of weeks, we've seen a lot of ideas become or that have been taken much more seriously. So it seems like stuff is afoot. I don't know. What do you think, Sarby? I think remote work will be um, more prevalent. I think that right now employees are seeing how much they can get done from home and that their jobs don't require them to be in office. So I think that um, the workforce will demand either a flexible working environment or just completely remote roles. I also think that employers will see that roles that haven't traditionally been um, remote can be, for example, legal and finance. There's been this idea that those need to be in office for confidentiality reasons. Um, and I also think that well, I hope that there will be a, a decrease in polarization and an increase in generosity, um, in compassion and, and just altruism because there's been so much tension over the past few years that it would be nice to look past our differences now and to see that we have a common enemy. And I mean, I mean, it seems weird to that call microbial it enemy, shit. But, but like, I, I just think it would be nice for everybody to have something to rally or rally behind and to sort of see that at the end of the day, we're all the same and we're all just trying to live and be the best we could be. So that's what I hope will happen. I also hope that um, people are cleaner and start to wash their hands more. And I especially hope after they poop, Michael, especially after that. There's just Why no does reason. everyone think I don't wash my hands after pooping? Because you don't. You were like a really strong, like you were just it's like very strong wipe. and like it's a clean wipe and that's part of their narrative and all of this like that the clean me as like wipe a is 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 the best thing you can do it's the hole in one of pooping but keep going okay so this is exactly why people think you don't wash your hands after you shit um also i think that this would be a great time to stop the social practice of shaking hands like I no. would love shaking hands is fine no it's not i'm a germaphobe and it's fine 
No. I, I love high fiving. I, I love shaking hands. I love I love dapping up. I love anything where I'm just mm-hmm. touching people right off the bat. Ooh, no. <clears throat> uh, well, two two things. I'll start with. I hope people wash their hands more, but I will say. You should shaking hands is probably good for a like if we can expose ourselves in non-crisis times to like lots of germs, that's just good. Obviously, when the bubonic plague or COVID's going around, stop shaking hands, please. Uh, but on the sort of unifying theory, I don't, I'm sorry, sir. We, I don't think that's going to happen. You don't think it's going to happen? No, people, like first of all, there's, there's two things. People want to scapegoat people as much as possible. And I have this mm-hmm. desire to as much as possible to be like that guy who got on the jet blue flight after he knew he had COVID. He's the real enemy. I, I, I said that. Uh, and so we're just going to find reasons to like, blame certain people for shit um Mm. you know whether it's like a country or a group of people or a specific person um i i don't see an end to that although i did see an article and i didn't read it but some studies show that during crises uh most people take on pro-social behavior which means that i think we have this idea that when disaster strikes everyone it's war of all against all everyone's looting everyone's doing this but for the most part obviously we see those people but for the most part people tend to be helpful to their fellow humans and so maybe that will happen but i don't think the large divisions in our country are going to be healed by this disease yes yeah because i mean the small examples uh, which bum me out are in, in terms of like cultural shifts, you know, we had to shut down all the beaches and parks in Los Angeles and much of California because dumb idiots were still like going to the beach and hiking and being around each other. So that's an instance where I felt, I feel like people's selfishness was on, on high alert. The other thing, this is kind of related. No one should be hoarding groceries. It's really stupid that we still can't get things. We have food. And I think that's an instance where it bums me out because you could see all these examples right now where we could come together, have solidarity, have a sense of social cohesion based on this. But people do just want to do themselves so much and do themselves. But you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I do worry about that. I want uh, What I'm saying is I want Serbia to be right. I worry she might be wrong. We all want Serbia to be yeah. right. I always want Serbia to be right all the time. Well, um, most yeah. of the time. <laughs> most of the time. Oh, is it, are you talking about the tipping thing? Yeah, that's exactly like, what I was thinking about. I, I oh, forgot I forgot was, yeah. that I hate her because of that. I forgot that you are yeah. an enemy of the working people. Shit. No. Um, yeah. I mean, one thing, too, even like, so, Alec, a lot of your examples are about uh, culture and politics in this really immediate sense. I think we're in an interesting era where our culture might change a lot. Because, you know, things like right now, uh, t- TV and films aren't getting made. There's no movie theater. So now we're releasing movies to streaming, like things like uh, like The Hunt and Emma and some other movies that are coming out soon that were going to be theatrical are now getting released in that format. Um, musicians aren't able to tour and make money that way anymore. We don't have live comedy right now. So I think we're, we're seeing a lot of cultural changes, and I'm curious to see how those last. Because I think... For example, like I think we might now just have a regular thing where a lot of theatrical releases are available online if we want to pay a certain amount of money. That might not have been the case before this. Yeah, and I think I wonder some of the cultural changes will happen through uh, like for business reasons. Like theaters are already struggling. Will there be a percent? And you know, it's the sort of death of the theater going experience has been something that like for instance Jared's always complaining about. Uh, this might be the nail in the coffin for a lot of theaters, right? They can't you know, depending on how long it goes on, maybe they just don't reopen. So like there is a sort of slow process of it, the decline that's co- kind of ramped up or, you know, I'm imagining there's a lot of restaurants that just like might not open up again. Now, I don't know if that leads yeah. to a cultural shift per se, like cinema does, but it'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be weird, weird to see. Um, any other thoughts on this, Alec or Serbi, or do we want to play Nostradamus a little bit more and predict other cultural changes? Or I just hope that whatever happens, that we keep the Zoom dance parties going. Wow. Yeah, maybe I think I'll you really, keep calling my parents yeah. regularly. Um, and I think I'm going to keep, I don't know, watching concerts with my friends during the day on the weekends and, uh, day drinking. So we all have something to, to set for a goal. Um, so before we wrap up, um, we want to hear from everyone who's listening to this right now. Um, and especially some of the topics today, I think we'd really love 
to hear um, y'all's takes on this, what you're doing to self-care, what you're doing to stay connected, and how you think our culture might change. So hit us up, as always, at culturebinge at wisecrack.co. No M. Culturebinge at wisecrack.co. And, and call us. We're talking about the importance of calling people you love. You probably love at least one, maybe two of us. Um, 213-534-8807. That's 213-534-8807. Call us. Let us know. Let us know what you're doing. Let us know what you think about these topics. Let us know things you'd love to see us talking about during this time. Because, of course, uh, our culture is changing, so we'd love to hear topics you might want to hear us talk about. But in the meantime, I think we're going to hear from someone who gave us a call after our last show, whose name is Logan, uh, and we're going to hear what, what, what he has to say. Uh, hi there. This is Logan calling in regards to the most recent Culture Binge episode, uh, specifically about the topic of communal living. Um, I wanted to call in because uh, I'm someone who has recently moved out of their parents' place and am now living with uh, five other roommates. I uh, got a couple of integrated couples in there as well, so the house is populated. And it is fantastic. I love being able to have my friends that I can go talk to and have my own private space of a room where I can be by, by myself. And I would absolutely hate the idea of living alone or with one other person and not having the ability to have dinner with people. Um, I also wanted to talk about some of the historical context uh, real quick. Um, you said that, I, I think Michael said that this is a weird American thing about living alone, and it is. But specifically, it happened um, post the Great Depression and post World War II, uh, where the idea of the nuclear family started. Um, before then, in America, it was still very common to have an intergenerational household as well as being able to live with friends without that being stigmatized. But again, due to a lot of cultural changes in the 40s and 50s, and that being just long enough ago for us all to think it was natural, um, that's kind of the development of the nuclear family and the sort of stigma about living with friends. I just wanted to share my thoughts. You guys always say you love hearing from us. So thank you for all your work and take care. I should say that was pre-Boomer, now that I heard the timeline better. But Boomer's yeah. really something, I don't know. Yeah. What a cool voicemail. What 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 that's yeah, what you want. You, want. you want you want personal anecdotes and you want historical context. Logan knocked it out of the park. That was um, great. Yeah, I do wonder how, how much Logan's going to like living with all these people. Because it sounds like it's a relatively new thing. I'll be curious to hear how that progresses over yeah. time. Logan, um, give us another call and update us about your social isolation with... With or not social isolation, but your your quarantine now at home. I mean, maybe the best time ever to start living communally because now you're yeah. you're stuck with a little crew. That sounds fun. Yeah, let us know. Yeah. Um. Well, thanks, call. Uh, thanks, Logan, for calling. Alec, did you have a thought? Uh, no, but I have some emails. Uh, about oh, I didn't know we had emails. I'm so sorry for 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 forgetting that. Let's get into it. Uh, yeah, we got some emails about online dating and also about houses. I will start with an email from Kartik. Hi, Wisecrack. Just wanted to email about the episode around buying a home with a group of your close friends. The first thing that came to mind when you mentioned this topic on the pod was Epicurean communes, where the basic idea is that the true path to happiness involves living a simple life, which with work which makes you feel like you are contributing to the greater good and nourishing relationships with your friends. Epicurus, quote unquote, achieved this by living out in a commune with his students' friends. They each had their own quarters, but with common areas. They took jobs that were more fulfilling, even though they would get paid less, and also focused time on self-reflection and writing down their thoughts. Do you think this is the kind of thing that these tech bro houses are trying to achieve? I think that's not what tech bros are trying to achieve, but I think I love the Epicurean example. I once spent two weeks of my life living in a makeshift Epicurean commune at my friend John's house in the Netherlands. And we just like got up and had breakfast together, sat outside and read books, took breaks to talk about ideas, and then went out and walked around and drank at night. And it felt really ideal. So I think that's cool. That's I don't th I don't think that's what the weird like tech dorm communes are. I think that's a way for corporations to make a lot of money by making people live in college dorms. Yeah, I think what they're they're going to market is kind of the promise of not necessarily in an epicurean sense, but like the promise of community, the promise of kinship, all this. But really it is like I think the things that bond communities is who's going to do the dishes and we're going to build a system and there's like shared responsibility and people take care of each other. 
and instead it's we hired a maid so you can be a monster yeah i mean i think like the the little inside baseball for the listeners uh a month ago or so uh, Wisecrack had to move into a shared working space for a little bit. So we were in a WeWork in Los Angeles that, of course, has this like communal ethos, blah, blah, blah. But no one talked to anyone else. Like everyone just walked around with their headphones, ignoring everyone else. I think we have one coworker, I won't say their name, who was kind of social and talked to other people. But I think that shows you like you put a bunch of millennials together in a space and they're just like air potted out the whole time avoiding eye contact. So I don't think we're getting an Epicurean commune in uh, these co-living spaces, sadly. But that was a great email. But I wonder if they have that in Europe, though. Like, is that, are we not doing that? Like, at a WeWork here? But, like, if a WeWork was in, like, Amsterdam or London or France or somewhere, like, are they doing that, I wonder? English people aren't. They hate each other. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I also feel like these spaces try to build that sense of community by, oh, dorms do this also i call it mandatory fun i was an ra and we were trained Mm. to have to do this but like throw around the ball and name a fact about yourself which i hate so goddamn much but anyway i feel like we work and these other places are trying to do that but nobody cares yeah anyway the last email we have is from michael not to be confused with not me yeah that'd be funny if you were just emailing he'll you'll never read my emails i write them every week Uh, This is about online dating. Hi, Culture Binge. I'm here to spread a word of hope to Jared, who, you know, was having some dating problems last time he was on the show. I've been single for just about six years with a tumultuous relationship with Tinder and never gotten a date. People shut down the conversation really quick or are really just shallow in their conversations or simply seem too desperate. They want just anyone, not me, which has led me to feeling upset. I'm a nerd, dungeon master for D&D, raid leader in WoW. Those are some good credentials. I love books, movies, and shows, so I am a creative soul looking for someone who gets that, but I am also on the autistic spectrum, socially awkward, and had a stroke eight years ago at the age of 18. My looks aren't top 10% either. Even if I do have days where I feel handsome, I am not a traditional catch, basically. But I would... But I have been adamant in my search that I wanted someone that suits me, and I wouldn't settle for less than a partner that might last me for life. And just this week, I connected with someone coming back after another Tinder hiatus. We've connected over an axe murderer joke and planned to compare axes on our third date. (laughs) Yeah. It has taken, what a great email. It has taken a long time, but finally I really connected with someone. There's still hope. Our first date is due this Saturday, so wish me luck. And they sent this, I think, before then. So, Michael, I I need to know how it went. This is great. I... I mean, I think, I think it's great you keep putting yourself out there. Uh, the only thing I might say, and I don't even think you're doing this, is I do feel like people have this tendency to try to hold out for who they think is perfect and not sort of open themselves up to someone who might not be. That being said, like as a, as a dungeon master, if you meet someone who berates you for having a cool hobby, like being a dungeon master, you can obviously filter that person out. But yeah, just be like open to, to new kinds of experiences. But I'm like, it's so, I think, uplifting to hear that you're just like persevering through the nightmare that is online dating. And also, I will say as an update to Jared's love life, I'm just, I'm going to keep it vague. It's going well. Uh, there, There's a person. I don't want to divulge too many details. And they found each other at a good time because, yeah. <laughs> Hmm. Uh, but yeah, Michael, thanks for that email. I hope the date went really well on Saturday. And a second, Alec. Um, yeah, look for people that you have the same interest with. But all I'll say is, is I'm, I'm currently uh, engaged with and live with someone who I have very few things in common with, but we love each other and it's great. So you never know. You never know. But that's awesome. Um, is that all for the emails today? That's all we got. Awesome. Uh, this has been a fun ride. So once again, please get in touch with us. As Logan said at the beginning of his voicemail, you always say you want to hear from us. And Logan and Michael and everyone else, we're not lying. So culturebinge at wisecrack.co, uh, 213-534-8807. We talked about a lot of stuff today. We'd love to hear your takes on all of that. So before we go, Serby, people are listening to this podcast. They think I want more Serby in my life. Besides giving them your address and social security number, where can they find you? Serby Patel 22 on Twitter. Great. Um, Alec, besides trolling the streets of Brooklyn, waiting to see you ride your bike past them, where can people find you? Please don't do that. Uh, I'm on Twitter <laughs> at WisecrackAlec. My tweeting has gone up exponentially. It's still not a lot, but... 
I'll, I'll say, I think Alex has had some really great tweets recently. So if you're not following already, what are you doing? Follow him. Um, and if you Thank want you. to stalk me, my address is, no, I'm kidding. Uh, you can find me at Michael O. Burns on Twitter. And then I'll, I'll plug this. Recently, I, I used to run a, a live comedy show with my buddy, Sean. We can't do it anymore, so we switched to Twitch. So uh, twitch.tv slash Burns. We're going live Tuesdays and Fridays. We have some fun guests. So uh, come hang out there if you want a live comedy talk show right in your living room you can watch in your underwear. Um, but that is all for us. So for Alec and Serby, I'm Michael. This has been Culture Binge, and we will see you again in a couple weeks. Later, guys. Bye. Bye.